Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you. Hi, everyone. First of all, I have to start with two apologies. The first one is that I don't speak Italian. Uh, and the most sincere apologies to the translator that needs to understand my Irish accent, but I'm sure we'll get through it. The second apology is from Michael uh, O'Leary, who had hoped to come today, but unfortunately it's our half-year results, so he's travelling abroad speaking with our investors this week. So uh, he has kindly volunteered me, which is unlucky for you, but uh, we'll do our best. Um, I'm also delighted that, that you've uh, to welcome you here to, to the Reiner Hangar, which is our second hangar here in Bergamo. And if I had known there was going to be so many people, we probably would have charged for allocated seating, but we will push on nonetheless. So, when... There we are. So, when I spoke with, uh, with President Scalia, he had asked me to talk about connections and connectivity. And it's an interesting question because the two words are very similar but they mean very different things to us, particularly in Ryanair. And coming from an, from an island, um, you know, when we're asked to talk about connectivity, the thing that comes to our mind is that when we wanted to travel maybe to a regional destination in Italy, such as Cagliari or Pescara or Bari, the only way we could get there was with a legacy carrier through a hub uh, airport, such as Heathrow, where we'd have to connect and get another flight, and maybe get another flight. So it's two or three connections. And what that really means for us then is that connectivity is, is nothing more than a euphemism for constraints and for limitations. And what really matters to us is direct connections. They're the key. And that's something that we know a little bit about. That's our network. So as you can see, it, we have 88 bases, over 200 airports going from Aberdeen in the north to Aqaba in the south, uh, Ponte Delgada on the west, all the way over to Kiev on the, on the east. And what we do with all of these 200 plus airports is that we have roughly 2,000 daily flights across 1,800 routes, and we're connecting passengers, working, or businesses, tourists, family and friends directly. Rather than any through connections, it's a direct connection, point to point, and that's what's key. So ultimately, you could say we, we do something similar to, to our, our next speaker from, from Amazon in that we've removed the middleman, which is effectively high-cost, inefficient hub airports. So what's necessary for direct connections? The first one is low fares. And as you can see there, our average fare is 39 euro this year, which is you know, our closest competitor is roughly 18 to 20 percent more expensive. And you can see it there. So effectively, 39 euro leads to connections, 196 euro leads to connectivity. And when I talk about, you know, why are low fares so important for driving connections, there's two reasons. One is for new connections when you talk about a new route. So for example, I, I, I'd like to hope that lots of you have traveled with us from Bergamo before. Uh, we have 90 odd routes. One of them is Lappenranta in Finland, which I certainly had never heard of before we started flying there. Um, some of you may not have, but for a price of 39 euro, most people will say, well, do you know what, I'm going to go and I'm going to find out and I'll see what the place is like. So it facilitates and stimulates interest in new traffic to new destinations and new markets. But in addition to that, even on established routes, we can create new connections for people that previously wouldn't have traveled because they were constrained by the connectivity that's driven by you know, connecting flights. And what I mean by that is if you take, for example, flights between Lisbon and Paris, where historically there's maybe 20 flights a day. We started flying the route three years ago with an extra daily flight. And what Lisbon Airport found when, when they started to survey our passengers was that 40% of the traffic on our flights. It was a first time visit for them to Lisbon. So even on a route as saturated as having an hourly flight between two destinations, almost half of our traffic was new and incremental. And that's why the importance of low fares in driving that kind of traffic. Now, low fares are very easy to provide and to provide them profitably is another issue. And that's why we need to focus on our costs effectively. So the two ingredients are low fares and low costs. 
on low cost, we generally, as you can see, we generally have a cost advantage of around 50% against our closest competitor on a unit basis, excluding fuel. And that's generally driven through uh, a very fierce discipline on every line of cost. And I'm sitting, or I'm standing, looking, looking at Emilio uh, down there, who, who we've had lots and lots of interesting conversations about the costs of Bergamo and how I think they're too high and how he thinks it's unfair. Um, but it, he can be reassured by the fact that it's every cost line, not just airport costs, that are important to us. And when you get the two things right, when you get low fares and low costs together, it creates very much a virtuous cycle. So it begins by having a very efficient airport, but in for the infrastructure, airport operations. That in turn facilitates low costs at the airport. When you have low costs at the airport, it attracts carriers who then can introduce new routes, new connections, drive traffic, drive volumes. And as they drive those volumes through the airport, there's two things. Firstly, we pay for the, air, the use of the airport, and secondly, our passengers purchase goods and non-ancillary uh, purchases at the airport, which helps them drive further revenues. So that, in turn, drives footfall, drives volume, and drives greater revenue, which is a virtuous circle, which again facilitates lower costs and more growth. And I think it's fair to say that Bergamo have done uh, an absolutely excellent job in delivering that. And I think the result speaks for themselves. When you look at our traffic in 2002, we had about 350,000 passengers with two routes. In 2018, that's our network there. So we have 90 direct routes. We have 10.4 million passengers. Bergamo is now our third largest airport by a distance. Uh, it's only after Dublin and Stansted. It's our largest continental base where we have 17 aircraft based here year round. So it's an absolutely fantastic result and it's a testament to the, to the job Emilio and his team have done. Um, and the benefits aren't just for the airport in that respect. That, that Effectively, it's important to note that they flow very much to the locality and to the wider region, particularly in, in terms of employment when you look at the direct and indirect jobs that passengers and air traffic can deliver. Um, for example, Air Council International, which is a, an airport uh, union kind of group, their studies have shown that for every million passengers that a low-cost carrier brings to an airport, it creates 750 jobs, which means that here in Bergamo, there's around 8,000 jobs indirectly created straight away. But more than that, in bringing tourists and in bringing business to Bergamo, what it means is that it drives all kinds, it has a huge multiplier effect on the traffic or on, on, or on the economy, in that it's an engine for economic growth, because the tourists, they'll spend money in hotels, they'll spend money on car hire, and all of the other businesses that prosper and develop. And just for an example, the, the, the latest information we could get was to show that the average tourist spend in Italy in 2017 was 431 euros. So, when we bring a passenger to Bergamo for 39 euro, what they spend is tenfold in the local economy. So it is a huge, huge benefit. And you could argue that you know, Bergamo is unique because it's, you know, it's in Lombardy, it's a very prosperous region, it's got huge tourist attractiveness, it's got a phenomenal business background, so it's unique in its ability to sustain that kind of growth and that kind of connections and the direct connections. But generally, we'd argue otherwise in the sense that if you look at our network for next summer in Italy, that shows that the growth and the new routes and the new direct connections aren't concentrated in any one place, but rather all across the map and all across the country. And what that means is that it creates an opportunity for regions to become hubs in themselves. So, for example, Bologna, we have 42 international routes, Pisa something like 36, Bari 18. And what that means is that by creating these direct links and without the need for having to sustain them through hubs, they can develop themselves independently and that kind of growth facilitates greater growth because suddenly there's more people traveling to the area, they understand it's a fantastic destination, there's lots to see, there's business links. So it creates huge opportunities to the extent that if you look at Bergamo relative to some other airports in, in, in Europe at the minute, for example, so you know, Bergamo has 104 direct EU routes. You know, the main airport for Germany's capital 
only has 92. Heathrow, which is a, the traditional hub, has 84. So what that means is that there's a huge opportunity if you take that a further step for Bergamo as, as an airport with 104 routes, generally with a load factor of around 90%. There's a huge latent demand here and, and a, a very attractive proposition for the idea of perhaps even a long haul carrier to develop in Bergamo because what it has historically, if you take the, the short haul, long haul feed business for long haul traffic, it really was a situation where airlines developed short haul as a means to satisfy the long haul traffic. What we have in, in reverse here is that we have Bergamo Airport with 10.4 million passengers, 104 routes, a ready-made partner for long haul traffic. Now, if only I could think of, of an airline that's interested in long haul traffic and trying to develop in Italy. Um, I can't think of any. Stefano, can you? But we'll try and get there. Um, so look, it, the question is then, is Bergamo the new, the new connectivity? And I certainly think there's an opportunity for it there. On the other hand, there's a wide number of threats to, con to connections and to direct connections. One of them, in our view, is airport systems. It's something that we touched upon, um, or, the, or the guys previously touched upon. Um, in that, for, for those of you that aren't familiar with it, generally an airport system is where you have in a city a certain number of, the number of airports within a set region, all controlled by one operator. Um, ADR in Rome is an example who control Fiumicino, uh, Ciampino. Another example are our friends in Sea, who control Lanate and, um, and Malpensa. And we have an excellent relationship with the guys in Sea. We carry two million passengers at the airport. But I can say, I think, with, with a lot of confidence, there isn't anyone in the room today that believes that if Bergamo was part of a wider airport system for Milan, it would not have 12 million passengers today. The reason it doesn't, is the reason it does have the passengers is because it was an independent airport and it was competing. And generally the facts support that because an airport system really means a monopoly system. And the only, the only people that think a monopoly is good are the monopolists themselves. Um, generally it means that there's reduced competition higher charges, and it'll constrain traffic. And if anyone needs an example of it, the London airport system is a perfect example where historically traffic was constrained. The three airports were owned by the same airport operator until the competition commission broke them up. As soon as they were broke up and privatized, Stan said in 2013, when it was sold, Gatwick in 2009, both have grown by around 45 to 50%. So it shows that competition works for both the customer and for businesses. Thankfully, generally airport systems are, the number of them are diminishing and the, the trend is, is declining everywhere, bar Italy, I have to say, um, where there seems to be a growing trend for it and it's certainly a threat and it needs to be considered as part of the, the impact it'll have on, on regions. The other one is that of government, ta government taxes and travel taxes. I've already spoken about the importance of low costs in order to drive low fares, in order to drive traffic and drive connections. Generally, experience across Europe has shown that where government taxes are introduced on air transport, quite be that through or a travel tax or a municipal tax, what it leads to is a constrained traffic, reduced capacity, the loss of routes. And we've seen it in a lot of places. We've seen it in Ireland, where a government introduced a travel tax and swiftly removed it. The Belgians did the same, and the Dutch did the same. The problem with travel taxes is that, firstly, they're flat. And what it means is that they have a disproportionate effect on regional airports, because generally regional airports will have a lower charge than the higher than the, the hub airports, which means that a tax accounts for a far greater percentage of the overall cost at a smaller air, regional airport. And if you take, I think I put Perugia as an example there, where Perugia, if you exclude the 33% tax that the municipal tax accounts for, it's got a lower charge than the likes of Porto and the likes of Seville, where it's competing. But with the tax included, it's at a competitive disadvantage. And it's very much the same in France, where the, the taxes are even greater. And the results of that have been very clear. So if you take a look at the traffic or the inter-Europe inter departing capacity growth over the last number of years, Portugal has grown by about 
Spain has grown by almost 30%, Italy's only grown by 12, and France has only grown by 10. Now, you know, Spain and Portugal are fantastic destinations and lovely places to visit, but I refuse to believe they are four times nicer than Italy. It just doesn't make sense. So clearly, government taxes and fees like that don't work, and they impose restrictions on the, on the possibility and the potential for direct connections. One opportunity that you can do in the sense that you can turn this threat into an opportunity, in the sense that if you take the municipal taxes, and what we've done here is that we list We've broken our airports, or the airports in Italy, into a number of uh, different brackets. So those on the far on the left column there, under the annual passenger threshold, that shows the departing passenger or departing capacity in the airports. So if you look at the bottom one, those airports with less than one million departing passengers, which are generally regional airports, which include the likes of Brescia and Crotone and Genoa, and lots of them, they account for 50% of the total number of airports in the Italian market. What they deliver in municipal tax charges is about 22 million a year. Now, the biggest problem with municipal tax is that it doesn't go to the municipalities. From what I read in the media, it simply goes to pay for retired Alapatale pilots who are still working in the Middle East. But, so I don't really know who's benefiting from the municipal taxes in the first instance. But why not consider removing the municipal tax at airports like those and smaller airports and regional airports in order to facilitate and drive and incentivize airlines to introduce, introduce more routes and drive connectivity. Because if you think about it, if you don't forget that you have to remember the benefits that are associated with it. For every passenger and tourist arriving, you've got 431 euro on average of a spend. It doesn't take that many tourists to get to 22 million euro. You know, roughly, it's about 100,000 total passengers, which equates to about a daily flight for Ryanair. I'm pretty confident we'd be able to find more than a daily flight for all of those airports in Italy. So it's very important that you know, we don't treat taxes, and your government doesn't treat taxes, as a means to restrict direct connections, and instead they should use direct connections you know, as an engine for economic growth, because that's ultimately what direct connections and direct flights and are and what they offer. So in that respect, we remain very, very committed to growth, committed to direct connections. We expect to grow from about 140 million passengers this year to 200 million passengers by 2024 as we grow our fleet from about 450 aircraft to 600. And we very much hope that Bergamo will continue to be a, a big part of that growth and those new direct connections. Thanks very much. Thanks, Neil. You don't speak Italian, but...